Tishu, you know, I don't like to read a bio because it's so formal. So in your words, do you want to give us a quick intro to some of the students here and participants who have not had the opportunity to know you before? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Teju Adisa Farrar, coming to you from La Nape land, also known as Brooklyn, California, but originally Jamaican American from Ohlone land, Oakland, California. And I am a geographer, writer, independent researcher, and consultant with a focus on a variety of things from sustainable fashion to regenerative agriculture, climate change, environmental justice. And I love being a part of Open EDU and being a, an educator for these wonderful courses that happen every semester. So I'm happy to be here. I'm happy that you all are here and gonna hang out with me for the next hour as we talk about regenerative design, um, specifically in textile systems. Thank you so much. And so everyone, it's 12.05. PM EST, not PST, PM EST. So I'm going to just shut off my camera and leave you with Teju. Thank you so much, Teju, and uh, have a good class. Thank you. Well, wonderful. Today we are talking about regenerative design, specifically in textile systems. So in this course, we're going to cover sort of a wide variety of things, not as specific as we could get, but more overarching to talk about some of the ways we can make our textile systems more sustainable and regenerative. So our textile systems not only have to be sustainable, they also have to be regenerative. Supporting and creating regenerative textile systems is how we get to sustainable fashion supply chains. Indigenous humans for centuries across the world have old regenerative textile practices. We can use some of their wisdom and practices to think about how to design regenerative fiber and textile systems today. So for those of you who know me, I love looking at indigenous practices and indigenous ways as an opportunity to inform the opportunities that we have today for re framing, transforming the way that our supplies, our supply chains work, the way that our society works, the way that our economies work. So let's start by talking about some indigenous textile ways that are centuries, centuries old um, across the world. And I want to start by saying that Textile systems are thousands of years old, literally thousands of years. Humans have been using fiber and animals to create textiles that we wear on a daily basis that we use for tablecloths and washcloths and all kinds of things. And so an explorer that I'm sure you all have heard of, Marco Polo, um, was a Venetian merchant, explorer and writer who visited India in the 13th century. He marveled at the sight of the six yard Indian cotton trees that produced the softest cotton balls. So although India had pro been producing textiles for centuries, it wasn't until the 13th century that Europeans got wind of these high quality, specifically cotton textiles that India was making, right? So what we know is that indigenous humans on the continent of Africa, in Asia and Latin America, across the Americas had these thousand year old artisanal textile systems that Europeans um, started infiltrating and appropriating as early as about the 11th century, but beyond. And now when we think of textile systems, um, we think of the sort of global supply chains, but they started with regions and geographies and communities in indigenous places across the world thousands of years ago. So throughout Asia, the continent of Africa and the Americas, indigenous humans were producing fiber and creating textiles in a way that we would now consider regenerative. For several centuries, most products were created using only local natural materials because that's what humans had access to. So now we talk about natural materials and sustainability um, and geographic specificity, but thousands of years ago, that was the way of life. So it wouldn't have been considered regenerative, but now we apply that term to practices that are actually not new, but very old. So I want to start with the continent of Africa and specifically West Africa, 
with a design called mud cloth. Mud cloth dates back to what is now modern day Mali before the 12th century. And the Bambara word for mud cloth is bogolan fini. And bogo means clay or mud, lan means by way of, fini means cloth. So even in the language, it describes the materials used for this type of textile. And now we see mud cloth in decor, pillows, benches, blankets, but it is a very old indigenous practice from Western Africa that is completely handmade in the most traditional way possible. So if it is the actual traditional process, then from start to finish, from seed to the end fabric, it is all handmade, made within communities, intergenerationally, Every, all genders are participating in this process. So the way that mud cloth is made traditionally is that it starts with the women hand spinning the cotton. And this cotton is locally grown. Cotton has been perennially grown in tropical Africa as early as the sixth century. And so women would hand spin this cotton using tools that were created from tree bark, from the woods of trees. And then the men would come in and weave these strips of cotton fabric together on narrow looms that were also made from trees. And then they would cut the fabric and sew these strips together. After that first initial two stages of the process, the women would come and dye the fabric in baths of leaves and branches, usually from the Ngalama tree. So all of the dye that was used for this process was from the trees that were located in this geography in tropical Africa in what is now Mali. After that process, it was then dried in the sun and painted with fermented mud. And so the fermented mud reacts with the tannin to produce a black color. So traditional mud cloth is usually a black color. It has a lot of the black colors in it. And that's because this fermented mud, which again is in the name of the traditional cloth, is what's reacting to these natural materials to create a different color. And so this process is generally done in the dry season because there's several cycles of natural dyeing needed. So again, it's not only about using the materials that are in the local region that you're in, it's about working with the weather and climate to use the natural flow of the environment for this process. So traditionally made mud cloth is perishable because it's created using all natural natural materials. Nowadays with decor and fast design, there is a lot more mud cloth being made by machines. So it's not going through the same artisanal, long, geographically specific process. But across West Africa and in Mali, they're still making traditional mud cloth, which is perishable, which is made in this artisanal way from these natural materials. So now we're going to move on to India. And the Indian subcontinent is believed to be the first place in the world where humans turn the cotton plant plants into fabric. So as early as the third century BCE, um, cotton was originated in the Indus Valley. And that is the first place where humans decided to turn it into fabric and turn it into textiles. And so the Indian subcontinent has a long, long history of textile cultivation, not only cotton, but also silk and wool. So cotton, silk, wool, these were the main natural materials used for several centuries on the Indian subcontinent and are still used today. So cotton was grown locally, of course, across the Indian subcontinent. The Tessa Aryan Muga silk moths were native to central and northeastern parts of the region. And so over time, Indians started to domesticate these moths, but initially silk was made from collecting wild silk moths of which a variety are native to the certain parts of India. And of course, mountain goats were raised in the colder parts of the region like Kashmir, Ladakh and the Himalayas and Pashmina was made from the inner fleece of the goats, which was collected after the goats shed in summer. So again, using all materials from what is regionally specific, but also not forcing these materials to come. So by collecting the goats, uh, fleece that was shed, they didn't have to prematurely um, shave the goats, which happens a lot now, especially with cashmere, because of the demand for cashmere and pashmina, which are high quality textiles. 
So India has always been known for high quality fabrics and textiles. And actually until the 19th century, India had the largest textile trade, but the enslavement of Africans in the Americas, specifically the cultivation of cotton, allowed Britain to gain global dominance in the 1800s. So through the enslavement of Africans and the cultivation of the cotton plant mass produced in the Americas, they were, over to, they were able to overtake um, the Indian subcontinent in the textile trade because of this influx of cheap labor of forced enslaved Africans, as well as um, huge manufacturing factories across the UK that did not have labor laws, did not have environmental laws at that time. So we know that India has this rich artisanal textile, high quality textile practice for centuries. And actually, when we think about imitation um, or counterfeit, the first counterfeit products were actually made by the British. This is a quote that comes from a book called Black Bodies, White Gold by Anna Arabidin Kesson. And the quote says, British imitations of Indian made cotton were not always successfully sold abroad. West African consumers had specific tastes and could easily identify the flaws of European imitations, even though European traders attempted a range of strategies to mitigate this problem, from imitating patterns and colors to exporting European-made textiles under Indian names. So the British were trading with West African merchants for enslaved Africans and spices, and they wanted to trade high-quality cotton made products, but they didn't have high quality cotton made products because they were made in factories. They were largely manufactured. They were not artisanal. They were not handmade. And a lot of West African merchants could tell the difference. So the first counterfeit fabrics and textiles were made by British trying to imitate this centuries old regenerative practice of Indian made textiles and especially cotton. So if we come over to the Americas, where indigenous people were also using regenerative practices to create all types of fabric and textiles, we have lace bark, which was used in the Caribbean to make a natural version of lace. So the first fiber used for crafting on the island of Jamaica was made from lagetta trees. The lagetta tree, also known as a lace bark tree, is native to Jamaica, Cuba, and Hispaniola, which is the island that contains Haiti and Dominican Republic, Arawaks and Taino. Indians use the inner bark of this tree to make rope, hammocks, and baskets, and enslaved African women used it to make natural lace-like material. So in addition to the knowledge passed on from indigenous Arawaks and Tainos in the Caribbean, enslaved African women had knowledge from tropical Africa where they made all kinds of cloth out of bark. So enslaved Africans were not at all um, novices in terms of using trees and other materials to make bark out of. So it was this ingenuity of enslaved African women along with these indigenous practices that created this lace-like material that enslaved African women were able to use to create beautiful garments in the midst of the violence of slavery. And while enslaved African women were making garments like dresses and lace and bonnets, slave masters used the lace bark to create rope for whips. So the inner layer of the bark from the lace bark tree can be made into this lace-like material by soaking it, stretching, and sun bleaching. So again, this slow process that has to do with the environment and the climate, you soak the bark so it gets soft and is more malleable, and then you start to stretch it. And as you stretch the bark, these sort of holes, these pores form to make the design that we now see as lace. And then you bleach it in the sun to make it a sort of cream color, to make it a sort of whitish color. So hundreds of years ago, indigenous humans, enslaved African women were using the inner bark of trees to make lace-like products completely handmade, completely naturally using what was in the region that they were living in. So as we think about indigenous textile ways and learn from these ways that have to do with being climate specific, geographically specific, we can talk about how we know something is regenerative. Because a lot of times regenerative, sustainability, those are words now that are thrown around 
all kinds of brands and designers are using them. And it's not even clear what about their practices or processes or supply chains make them actually regenerative. So before we talk about how we know something's regenerative, I developed a couple definitions about what being regenerative is. It is an approach that transforms current systems by centering indigenous geographically specific practices that enhance and preserve ecological bioregions. This results at this point in climate change mitigation, maintenance of healthy soil and natural waterways, and thus an alternative regional social, social ecology and economy. So when we use regenerative practices, this leads to sustainable lifestyles. So sustainability is being able to provide for current and future generations without violence, oppressive hierarchies or environmental devastation. Consistent and sustained livelihood conditions along with agency and dignity and systems that undergird our lives are what makes something truly sustainable. So regenerative and sustainability are not the same thing, but by using regenerative practices, we give ourselves more opportunities to actually be sustainable. And so what are some of the ways that we can tell if something that we're designing or creating or making is regenerative? Well, first, we need to think about what goes into making a system regenerative. It's about the environment. It's about the economy. It's about equity. And it's centered around communities. So if we're not thinking about the environment in unison with equity and unison with the economy centering communities, then probably the system is not regenerative. So let's get into some specifics. First, we want to start with the ground, right? Using seeds and other raw materials, including animals, that are native to the region. This is so important. As a result of colonialism and imperialism, there are so many non-native species and animals that are in all different parts of the world. And so one of the ways we can make sure that we're working towards regeneration is using seeds and raw materials that are native to the region. And as a result of companies, corporations like Monsanto, organic non-GMO seeds are very difficult to obtain and in some cases absolutely illegal. So these large corporations make it almost impossible for certain communities to use endemic native seeds that are also organic. So one of the ways we can know for sure something is regenerative is by looking at the seeds. Cultivating seeds and crops in biodiversity is absolutely paramount. One of the things that colonialism did was globalize monoculture. And monoculture is problematic because it favors uniformity and mass production over quality and overall environmental health. Biodiversity allows for overall environmental health, including soil health, including the health of the species surrounding the area, including insect health and climate stabilization. So monoculture is when you plant one crop in mass across a wide area, getting rid of the other diverse crops and plants that give the habitat its diversity and its ecosystem health. The other thing that is paramount to making sure that whatever you're creating or making is regenerative is not using pesticides or other chemicals in the process. So many pesticides and insecticides were created during the World Wars to kill crops as a war tactic. Of course, the most popular insecticide pesticide that we know of is DDT, which was not actually used as a war tactic. It was used to help soldiers who were in other parts of the world um, not catch diseases. But in general, after the world wars, agriculture became the market to sell these products. So insecticides and pesticides sort of fueled this mass production, mass industrialization, and created a market for a lot of chemicals that were actually created as war tactics. And when we're thinking about war, we need to also recognize that the US military emits more carbon emissions than most countries in the world. So in general, if the military is involved, especially the US military, it is not regenerative or sustainable. The mil US military uses more, emits more carbon and uses more oil than many countries in the world. So not using chemicals on fiber crops such as cotton should also extend to food sovereignty because chemicals are not only used on our fiber crops, they're also used on our food crops. So what is food sovereignty and why is it important? Well, if a system is regenerative, then it needs to be 
integrated with other agricultural systems such as food. So regenerative fiber systems are only possible with food sovereignty. La Via Campesina defines food sovereignty as the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agricultural systems. So this is really key. It's not just about having access to healthy food. It's about having culturally appropriate food and having the agency and dignity to define the agricultural food systems that work for you based on your culture, based on your community, based on the region that you're in. Because of Monsanto and other types of corporations, a lot of communities no longer have full control over the agricultural systems that they want to use and they are forced in some cases to use these non-sustainable um, systems that go against indigenous ways. So food sovereignty is also tied into our regenerative fiber systems if we truly want to live in sustainable ways and design in sustainable ways. We have to think about all aspects of the agriculture because ultimately everything that we make in this life at some point has come from the earth. So how else do we know that it is regenerative? The production is on a limited scale. This is really important. The scale and the region of the system or the supply chain cannot grow infinitely. Infinite growth is not regenerative. It is not sustainable. That idea of infinite growth is what led us to the climate crisis that we're in now, this colonial legacy of constant expansion, constant um, consumption is what is causing us to be in the crisis that we're in now. So the production needs to be on a limited scale. The goal should not be to produce as much profit as possible by saving on labor and material costs. So if the goal is to produce as much profit as possible, most likely corners are being cut on raw material quality, on labor and on other material costs, which ultimately lead to it not being regenerative, not being sustainable. After a certain scale, it can no longer be regenerative, right? So corporations can never be regenerative because at the scale at which they operate, because they operate on such a huge global scale with this imperative for profit, they're never going to be regenerative and they're never going to be sustainable. In fact, we actually need to scale down the global economy's current rate of production to live within the ecological limits of our planet. And there is a concept called degrowth, which is about scaling down all production, all consumption to make sure that we are aligned with what our planet can actually provide for us and that we're regenerating in the process and that we have what we need to thrive and live a high quality of life, but not to a point that is excessive and extractive, which means that the sky should not be the limit, the ground, the soil should really be the limit. When we're thinking about how to make something regenerative in soil and, and regenerative and sustainable, it's not about how much money we can make or how big we can grow the company. It's about how we can make sure that we're cultivating the soil and the ground that our materials ultimately come from. The other thing about making sure that these systems are regenerative is that the profit that is produced supports and most of it stays in the community and bioregion in which the products are created. So in our current capitalist model, which is extractive, flows of profits and finished goods go to the West rather than the places that actually created the value. So a lot of the things that we consume in the US are made in China and Southeast Asia, in some cases in Latin America, and the profits and those products are flowing to the US and Europe rather than staying in these regions that are creating most of the value and providing the raw materials for the products and textiles that we love and use on a daily basis. So what regenerative systems offer are opportunities for skill building and creativity to those who have been excluded, exploited or overlooked because of neoliberal policies like outsourcing. So if something is being made in Laos or Vietnam, then the profit produced, the value needs to also be impacting Laos and Vietnam and the communities usually of women, young women of color who are making our products and who 
will not get paid even a quarter of what we pay for the product and whose livelihoods are not healthy and whose environments are polluted, right? So we need to make sure that when we are producing products that the profit is not only going to shareholders and investors and these big brands and designers, but actually going to the people, the hands, the communities, the geographies that make these products that we use on a daily basis. Finally, the textiles or whatever product it is can return to the earth once it has been used over and over again because of course if you're making a high quality textile or product it can be used over and over again and then you give it to your friend and they use it over and over again and so after it's used over and over and over again in its returning the earth is not poisoned now that doesn't mean that you could just throw your shirt down on the ground and it'll biodegrade what it means is that we have technology and systems to compost textile and products so that they can go back into the earth to create the soil and the loam that we need to grow the plants and the crops and feed the animals that ultimately make our products in the first place. So as you all know, if you are slow factory veterans, waste is a creation and outgrowth of colonial expansion and mass industrialization. So if textiles or products are being wasted, then it's not gonna be regenerative. If we wanna continue living on earth, we have to create systems that have virtually no waste in all parts of the supply chain. So that means no waste of tools, no waste of people, no waste of raw materials, no byproduct waste. So if you are looking at supply chains, what is not being used in the final product? Can it be used elsewhere or can it be composted or can it be repurposed in some way? So it's not just about recycling and reusing, it's about really finding ways to compost the materials that make up our lives. And that is a huge aspect of regeneration is not having waste. So, I say all this to say that there are other possibilities. There are other ways to have regenerative textile systems that are happening now and that are growing and that we can all participate in from the seed, the cotton seed that grows our shirt to it being sewed and us wearing it. Our current supply chains are globalized. There are materials and products going back and forth across thousands of miles. There are trains, uh, ships, trucks, thousands, tons of thousands of carbon emissions. And we don't really know all the places that our products touch before we get them. And we don't know the people or the social relations involved in how our products are made. So our current supply chain is not sustainable. So what we need to do is move from this sort of linear economy of take, make, waste through the recycling economy really to a circular economy. And so our systems need to move from valuing globalized extractive supply chains, which is what we all live through now, to circular regional economies. And so there has to be sustainable practices happening at every stage of production from the first seed to when it reaches our skin. Okay, so in order for it to be regenerative and sustainable at every stage of how this product is made, we need to think about how we can make it regenerative, how we can have zero or very low waste, how we can make it compostable, how we can make sure that the people who are making our products are paid well, are living well, how we can make sure we're not polluting the earth, we're not taking more than we actually need. And one of the organizations that I love and work with that is at the forefront of this is Fibershed. And Fibershed has a soil to soil framework, which talks about a circular model for producing our clothing and our textiles and our fibers from soil to soil. So you can start at any point in the circle and it always comes back around. So if we wanna start with compost, the compost is applied to the pasture and farmland. This range in farmland provides the nutrients for the cotton plants and the dye plants that are planted in the ground to the sheep and goats that are eating the plants that will ultimately make our fibers. And so these cotton plants, bass plants, hemp plants, these dye plants, the, the wool of the sheep, 
provide um, the fiber and dyes, which are then processed, they're cleaned, they're spun, they're dyed, and they're woven or knit into fabric, which designers and makers cut, sew, design to create textile garments that we then purchase, we wear, we love them, we use them, we share them with our friends, and then we recycle these garments back into the compost, which again provides the nutrients that starts the cycle over again. So Fiber Shed works with over a hundred producers, makers, farmers, ranchers to use climate beneficial regenerative practices to create our fiber and dye systems that undergird the systems in our life. So they are one organization that is leading the charge to a soil to soil framework. Another amazing organization that is thinking about farm to fashion and slowing down, slowing down fashion and thinking about really high quality materials is Looms of Ladakh. And as we know, Ladakh is an indigenous region that has a long history of wool and textiles. And so Looms of Ladakh is a woman owned wool textile cooperative and is based in the Himalayan region of Ladakh, India. And it is a farm to fashion initiative that is sustaining the fiber tra traditions of the Changpa nomads. So on their site, they say Looms of Ladakh Women Cooperative is the fruit of a skill development initiative Project Laksal. This project aims to bring together unemployed women artisans from remote villages of Ladakh and the best raw materials are sourced locally from the indigenous nomads and frontier livestock rearing communities of Ladakh who are the exclusive source of the world famous Changtangi, Pashmina, Bactrian camel wool, yak wool, and sheep wool. So the women from these communities, the women who are maintaining the tradition of their grandmothers and their forefathers and their foremothers from sourcing the wool from the goats and the sheep to turning it into bale and spinning it into fiber and looming and weaving it into fabric at every stage, these women are involved in this hand made sustainable very slow process of creating this amazing high quality wool so these are two examples of organizations that are working towards circular sustainable and regenerative regional regional economies for our textiles and there were so many others there's oshadi collective in tamil nadu india there's seed to shirt based in california so there are a lot of organizations that are now thinking about more circulative circular regenerative models of creating our fiber and textile systems so there are so many regenerative fashion alternatives happening in regions around the world right now, we can transform current mainstream extractive supply chains to regional circular economies that allow communities and the earth to thrive. And so when you are a brand or a designer, you're like, okay, how do I start doing this? How do I start becoming more sustainable, becoming truly regenerative? Let's talk about it. If you're a brand, how do you start transforming your supply chain? How do you start thinking about making the way you make things more regenerative? Well, the first and very important thing is really understanding the different levels of your supply chain. A lot of times we don't know what's happening in supply chains. So it's important to uncover the most opaque parts of the supply chain. So the parts we have no idea where certain material is coming from, or you don't know how many places it reaches before it gets to you or gets to the sewing factory, you need to really get down to the details of how your current supply chain operates and all the different places around the world that your current supply chain operates. That's the first thing that needs to happen. Once you start to understand your supply chain, you need to do an environmental and social analysis of your current supply chain. Hire someone, hire researchers to do an environmental and social analysis. You need to understand how your current environmental, how your current supply chain is making a negative environmental impact, how it impacts the society and communities and workers who are part of the supply chain and really understand all the nuances of how your products are made. 
then you need to think about scaling down and decentralizing. And when you're thinking about that, you could also think about decolonizing, but really scaling down the production and decentralizing the production. One of the things that colonialism and imperialism does is centralize production and profit in certain areas while completely negating and neglecting other mm -hmm. areas. So this includes scaling down on the different regions that parts of your supply chain happen in. So if your supply chain is happening in five different countries on three different continents and your products are moving back and forth thousands of miles producing carbon emissions, then that needs to be scaled down and decentralized and think about working within bioregions and supporting and uplifting local economies. So not only scaling down, but decentralizing and relocalizing and focusing on bioregions rather than where the cheapest product is or where it could be made most cheaply. You need to also make it slower and make less. The industrial revolution and the onset of machines has made it so that a lot of products are machine made. They are no longer handmade. And just because it's machine made doesn't mean it's automatically lower quality, but in a lot of cases, machines are created to make things as fast as possible, so they don't have the same love, care, and tension, and awareness of something that is made by hand, right? So when we make our products and our textiles slower, we can make them higher quality with more intention and care, so they last longer. We also need to make less in general. We do not need 100,000 tank tops from Forever 21 or even Zara. We need to make less clothes in general and make them slower and at a higher quality so that they last longer, so that people are not buying clothes all of the time. Find suppliers who use sustainable, ethical, and climate beneficial processes. So a lot of times when we're uncovering our supply chains, we realize that the suppliers that we're using are not practicing ethical or climate beneficial practices in their process of supplying us with materials. So we need to find the suppliers who do use sustainable practices who are interested in regeneration, who are thinking about the ethics of the people involved in making and procuring the products that we use. Okay, don't be a corporation, be a cooperative. Again, corporations are inherently unsustainable and not regenerative because of their scale. So scaling down and decentralizing and not being a corporation is one of the ways you could start to transform your supply chain. This goes hand in hand with supporting worker owners and workers at every level of the supply chain. I'm sure some of you know the Garment Workers Center who advocate on behalf of workers, but workers at the lower levels of the supply chain who do the cut and sew, who pick our cotton, who, who shed the goats and the wool, they are treated poorly. And so by encouraging worker ownership, then workers have a stake and equity in the organization, in the company, and their value is actually what it needs to be rather than the devalued labor that we see now. So support worker ownership and workers and cooperatives. Um, you don't have to be a cooperative to be sustainable and regenerative, but it is one way that you can put more power and agency in the hands of workers, and that helps create a sustainable business and a sustainable organization and higher quality products. And finally, seek out resources. There are indigenous practitioners, there are researchers, activists, organizations, and consultants who can help you become more sustainable and regenerative in your brand and design supply chains. There are resources through Slow Factory, through Fiber Shed, through so many organizations. So ask for help, you know. Um, a lot of brands and designers don't know where to start. And so there are resources, especially now, that can help you become more regenerative and more sustainable. So the current system that we live in is by design which means that we can design better systems from indigeneity to modern initiatives, humans have been 
and continue to build regenerative fiber and textile systems. So it is entirely possible. It's happening now. And hopefully through some of the things that I've shared, you could start thinking about how to make something that you're doing more regenerative and more sustainable. So I would love to answer some questions in the next 15 minutes and hopefully uh, give you all some more information about this topic of regenerative design and specifically with textile and fiber systems. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and open up the floor to questions. Okay. Thank you so much. Wow, so great. Thank you so much. Take some time to just go through the chat because the comments are so interesting. But of course, all your questions are in the Q&A. And if you want my help, I'm here to support and just pulling some questions. I just wanted to highlight one thing is that recently, this week, I think there was an Atlantic research that talked about the return of um, items like textile so sold because there's a culture of purchasing as a form of healing or as a form of self-care. Uh, folks go purchasing things mindlessly weekly. And there's a big culture around going to the store, purchasing things weekly, like kind of mindlessly adding to cart and then returning all of these things in the week later or the few weeks later, at least before the end of the month, there was this research in the Atlantic and that free re free returns system and model, of course, it encourages consumption, but it also costs so much money to corporations because every time they have these returns, it costs them hundreds of billions of dollars to manage. There are zero incentives for these corporations to act morally. So, of course, they could be donating these goods because they're still in good form, they could be refurbishing them or reselling them even, but these goods never return on the floor, they never return on the racks, they are never sold back to folks. In fact, they are incinerated or thrown into the landfill, like very good items. And the article argued that it could be very easy for the corporations to act morally, but they have zero incentives on doing so. Do you want to elaborate a little bit, just as you said, don't be a corporation, be a co cooperative. And how would you comment on this, uh, on this article? I feel it's very relevant to what uh, you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, the biggest reason why these brands don't have incentives to save these garments is because it doesn't make them money. And so if your central focus is to make the most profit, then of course you're going to throw away things that you can't sell. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there's no incentives. The incentive is that things are not being wasted. The incentive is that you are not contributing to landfills, which are normally in brown and black communities. The incentive is that you are not um, adding carbon emissions by moving these garments back and forth and then eventually throwing them away. So there are a lot of incentives that have to do with humanity and ecosystems and life, but don't have to do with making as much profit as possible. And usually these brands don't even need that extra profit. Those a thousand things that they throw away, they don't need that to survive or to be able to make more clothing. They just would rather make money from it. So the idea of a cooperative is that when workers own it, it's not only about making profit to sustain the enterprise, it's about making sure that the people involved have healthy lives, they have good livelihoods, and hopefully that there's not as much waste because you're not making as much because you're not producing on this large scale. So I think again, the scale is the issue when we're thinking about regenerative and sustainable. And so that leads me to one of the first questions that I see, which is about lace bark. Uh, and it says, lace bark looks beautiful. I'm wondering if there's any risk of exploitation of the legata tree. So actually, unfortunately, because of colonialism, the lace bark tree almost went extinct because slave masters were using it for whips and ropes to tie enslaved people up. So they actually um, harvested way too many lace bark trees. And so again, it's about the scale. A few enslaved African women harvesting it for some lace, indigenous Arawakan Tainos using it to make baskets and other things. 
is not really a big deal because the scale is not so huge. So um, the lace bark tree is not, uh, there are not as many as there were just um, some hundreds of years ago, but it still exists. And mostly now people are not making lace from the lace bark tree because there's manufactured lace, um, there's machine made lace. So that tradition has largely been, I don't wanna say erased, but it's not a tradition that is practiced anymore as a result of the lace bark tree being exploited due to colonial expansion in the Caribbean. So unfortunately, we've already seen how um, this expansion and this overconsumption impacts amazing artisanal natural processes that used to exist. Um, this is a good question from Ramon. Can the women who are making these high quality wool products afford to buy the products they're making themselves? That's super important. And that's one of the reasons why I said the profit from the products that are produced need to be able to stay in the region to some degree that it's made. I also believe that the products that are produced, some of them need to remain in the region. They should not all be exported. So in terms of blooms of Ladakh, it is my understanding that the wool that they produce, that they use as well in their community, they do export a lot of it, but they also use a lot of it as well. And so that is a really important point about circular economies is that there's not an emphasis on export. There's an emphasis on um, supplying for the region and community that you're in. And an example of um, how this happens in the US is uh, the US still is one of the largest producers of cotton, but most of the cotton produced in the US is exported to Southeast Asia to be processed and turned into fabric and clothing, which is then sent back to the US. So although we make cotton, we grow cotton in the US and we're still one of the largest producers of cotton, a lot of our cotton is actually exported and it, you're not always able to get US grown cotton in the US. So what's really important is that the folks who are making our products and growing our plants and feeding our animals that make our products should not only be able to use the products themselves, but they should not be only being exported. That's also not sustainable. Um, okay, other questions. It's an... Mm, do you know of any efforts to correct um, on the structural level, level? Is there anything we can do as consumers other than support good producers? Because it's unfair how producers who are doing good have to spend so much to get bio certifications. So there, one of the things that Fibershed does and um, other organizations is try to make uh, organic certification and um, regenerative practices less expensive. That is really a long-term gain and it has to game and it has to do with policies. Um, it has to do with changing the structures of businesses and what businesses get tax incentives for, what they don't get tax incentives for. I think it also has to do with foreign policy. And a, one of the ways that we change foreign policy is community organizing. And so in the 80s, late 70s and 80s, um, Reagan and Thatcher created these policies that essentially allowed for outsourcing, meaning you can make something anywhere in the world where it is cheapest. And so that foreign policy of corporations being able to go wherever it is cheapest is one of the main ways that it makes it harder for domestic organic sustainable brands and designers to compete because when you make things domestically, it's more expensive than making things in China, in Vietnam, in Peru, et cetera. And so we know that it doesn't have to be this way because in about 1960, more than 95% of all clothing in the US was manufactured and made in the US. Now it's less than 3%. So if we change these policies, we do political organizing, we do advocacy, we do um, community organizing, we push for um, more equitable foreign policy, we push to get rid of organizations like the, w the WTO, which is the World Trade Organization, the IMF, who largely have these really inequitable trade agreements with former colonial countries, that helps on a structural level, make it more feasible for domestic 
sustainable regenerative producers, designers, and brands to compete. Like I would love to be able to afford a $200 sweater that was made right here in the bio region, but that's not really accessible for me or anyone. And so when we have more folks um, reshoring and coming stateside and having to follow environmental regulations, having to have organic seeds, having to manufacture in the region where most of their products are sold, ultimately that will bring down the price of all of the products. So um, advocacy, policy, community organizing, foreign policy organizing, those are structural ways that we can change these supply chains. And there are organizations who are working towards these um, in a variety of ways. I think a good example is when um, the NAFTA agreement was first put on the table across the world, literally in Southeast Asia, in the US, folks were protesting, 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 protesting against NAFTA. Ultimately, it did go through, but it stalled it for a long time. And if we keep that sustained community organizing, then we could stall and ultimately stop some of these trade agreements and policies that not only don't benefit us as consumers in the US, but harm communities, livelihoods, and economies in other parts of the world. Okay, I will answer a couple more questions. Um, What do you do if you are already at scale and want to keep doing good and improving supply chain? Regeneration seems to be directly at odds with just the scale. And I know that scale comes responsibility and ability to impact real positive change. Um, so as I said, if you're already at a large scale, you need to downsize and consider um, rather than being like this huge corporation, maybe breaking it up to being smaller organizations that are potentially worker owned or in some format that is more sustainable and maybe you still keep the brand name but it is like there's different bioregions and geographies and smaller um, organizations within like a larger brand identity but again if you like are at a huge scale it's not really possible to be regenerative. So you have to scale down and you have to decentralize and you have to work within local regional economies. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to get rid of people or that you have to completely uh, shut down the organization. I mean, in some cases, like I don't believe Amazon should exist. I don't think Amazon should have like little Amazon outposts. I don't believe Amazon should exist. I don't believe ExxonMobil should exist. So at that scale, the only way for it to be sustainable is for those to not exist at all. But if you're a, a mid-sized brand and you're, you're pretty, you're scaled up pretty well, but it's not gonna be detrimental to sort of break up and have little hubs, I would encourage little hubs because also what people want to buy, what makes sense for people to buy is largely influenced by the region that they're in. Um, and so it could also be a good way to connect more with communities to be having these local economies, locally made um, products and systems. Um, okay, other questions. How do you think the philosophy of regenerative design can benefit energy systems since it seems that the slow handmade way leans less on electricity and industrial machinery? I think that's exactly right. I think you answered the question uh, in your question, which is that when you make less and you make slower, then you're using less electricity, less energy, um, spending less time using large industrial machinery, you're spending less time extracting from the earth. So I think the idea of regenerative design is that if we are doing things more slowly, more intentionally, and to the degree possible more handmade, then ultimately it's gonna create a ripple effect that transforms all of society. We're using less electricity since we're wasting less we're creating less carbon emissions from landfills, less methane from landfills. We're probably using less oil and we're gonna have to get to a place where we're not really using oil at all if we actually want to have humanity on planet earth for 
to more generations. So this process of being regenerative, slowing down, scaling down, decentralizing, decolonizing, all lends itself to creating a more sustainable society where we're consuming less, we're using electricity more efficiently, we're using less industrial machinery that requires oil. And in general, um, we are sort of scaling back our way of life. I mean, at the beginning of the pandemic, when folks stopped traveling, the carbon emissions literally went down just because people were traveling less in a matter of months. Can you imagine what would happen if we transformed our supply chains and our way of life to just make less? Then there would be some time for the earth to breathe and regenerate and for us to get aligned with the earth and with ourselves to make sure that we are preserving and maintaining ecosystems rather than destroying them with this constant back and forth and planes and ships and thousands of products and, and this sort of scale that's not sustainable. Oh, I love this question. How can I build a better relationship with my clothes? How can I stop getting tired of my items? This is such an important question. And it, it's like there's a spiritual answer and a practical answer. I think a spiritual answer is to think about what happens when you feel the desire to buy new clothes and what is happening when you're getting tired of clothes. Like what in your personal value in the way that you're feeling that week in the stress from work is making you feel like the way to feel better is to consume. And when you get tired of something, what is that? Is it because you've taken too many pictures in it? Is it because it's not made at a high quality? Is it because when you bought it, you were sad and didn't actually really like it? Um, I think one of the ways to build a relationship with your clothes that's more healthy is to make sure that you're either creating a store around your clothing or you're buying clothing that has a story. A lot of the clothes that I wear are from my grandmother. And so they have emotional meaning to me um, and sentimental meaning to me. And if I do buy clothes, I try to buy them sustainably or I thrift. And so I know that when I'm like in a thrift store, this is probably somebody's grandma skirt, you know? And so I just sort of make up a story in my mind about this piece of clothing. And I only buy it if I feel like not only do I really love and enjoy it, I look at the tag to see what quality it is, to see if I can make sure I maintain it for years and years, and if I will feel like I can wear it in a variety of ways all the time. So like a lot of the clothes that I wear are literally years old, like 10 years old, or in case of my grandmother's clothes, like 40 years old. And so like all of my clothes have a story and by wearing them multiple times when I'm, you know, I've worn the shirt like to go hiking. I've worn the shirt to do an open EDU class. I've worn the shirt on an interview. So when I wear this shirt, I, there's always some kind of story and feeling that I get from wearing it that makes me feel like I can have this forever. Literally, I will wear it into the ground. And hopefully by time it cannot be worn anymore, we have some composting systems where I could compost this. But most of my clothes, um, I don't buy it unless I can wear it into the ground. And I do a lot of clothing swaps as well with friends and community members so that I'm not necessarily getting something that new, that is new, but it feels new to me. Um, so I think really having better relationships with the things that we consume, not just clothes, everything that we buy is a great way to consume less and to consume more sustainably. Because when you're buying less, you can maybe spend $120 on those sustainably made pants that were dyed using indigo, natural organic indigo, because you're not buying five pairs of pants every month, because you're buying one pair of pants. I mean, I've literally bought one pair of pants in the last two years. So it's because of the way that I have like tapped into my spiritual relationship with consuming and um, that I want to always have a story so that I never feel like I can just let something go without thinking about it. I think when we put intention into everything that we do, including wearing clothes, choosing clothes, choosing products, then it gives us more opportunity for it to be sustainable. And a lot of times we're just consuming mindlessly. So like being intentional and mindful really does make a difference. Okay, so I think that's our time. I'm gonna answer one more question from Michelle. Where do I begin as a designer to look to native plants and species and indigenous practices as a basis for textile and construction design? Books. I cannot stress enough how much I read, 
how many books there are, whatever specific query or question you have, I promise you, you can put it into Google or put it on Instagram and you will get hundreds, thousands of responses about native plants, native species, indigenous practices. A good resource is called native-land.ca. And it basically is a map of the world and it shows in any particular geography or zip code what indigenous folks land that was. So you go to the website, you put in your zip code or your city and it'll zoom in to the, the indigenous tribes that were there, the treaties that were broken if they have them, the languages, and you could basically just Google those indigenous tribes, go to their websites and see what their practices were. They'll tell you what plants they were using. They'll tell you about the traditional basket weaving, cotton weaving, uh, hemp weaving processes, like learning about the indigenous communities in the region that you're in will give you a lot of insight into what is native and what practices have been happening for centuries in a sustainable way. There's also um, a lot of books about regenerative textile design, and there is a growing um, field in like sustainable construction and particularly getting to uh, decrease the carbon emissions from construction in general and using materials that aren't toxic and are not polluting at the rate that they have been and using safer materials. So Google the most specific things, go on Instagram, use Slow Factory, use Fibershed, use all of these resources and just ask for what you need because there's a lot of information out there. And like, there's so many opportunities. Also just Slow Factory has a waste design challenge that they do. That is another resource to learn about how you can use waste in more effective ways. So anyways, thank you all for listening. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. you didn't even need us for moderation. We're like, okay, let's just hide our cameras and let Tiju, yeah. on. she's on a roll. So you did amazing. Thank you so much. Of course, there are over 25 questions that we've received. We will record them. All of the comments are going to be also recorded. Alan, I'll hand it over to you. Yes, I just wanted to say thank you, Teju, for the knowledge you shared with all of us here at Slow Factory. It definitely reminded me of, you know, my roots and where I come from and it put a different perspective on indigenous textiles that I just never really thought about before. So thank you for sharing that and for highlighting, you know, to go back to the original caretakers of the land and how we work with our uh, textiles and the land, the herbs and everything. So it was just beautiful to learn that. So thank you. And um, yeah, I've that's everything right that's everything so i know some people are, are dropping uh tissues handle on uh, instagram in the chat i don't know if you had the chance to look a little bit at the chat it's uh it was really really fun to see the reaction of everybody throughout the, the talk but the chat will be recorded so if you ever want to access it just let us know and again Teju, thank you so much thank you antonio thank you john and nick for organizing um the accessibility part of the open edu as always and again thank you Teju. don't forget to give us your resources i know in some of the questions they're asking books podcasts resources anything that you uh, used to build the, 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 the class today. And of course, Fibershed is a wonderful resource as well. We, we love Fibershed and thank you for mentioning them. Uh, they're an incredible group. I have a lot of resources and classes as well on natural dyes and natural textiles and indigenous practices. Um, so thank you for that. And any final thoughts before we leave? Just use the chat as a resource. I'm just scrolling through. Folks have so many resources, so use the chat for the resources and have a happy Friday, everyone. Thank happy you Friday guys. and have, have, a good a, have a good um, Indigenous Peoples Day on Monday. Yeah. And we yeah. will be off and uh, we'll, we'll come back on Tuesday. So thank you very much, mm -hmm. everyone. Thank you to the interpreters. I appreciate it. Sorry if I spoke too fast. I tried to be slow. <laughs> thank you. You were fast. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. Have a beautiful weekend. Bye. Bye.